Welcome to Mom and Mind. This is a podcast all about perinatal mental health and wellness related to conception, pregnancy, birth, loss, postpartum, and new parenthood. But more than that, we aim to deepen our truths, shed light on real issues, speak about our pain, feel understood, and offer a path to healing. We raise the volume on these topics in hopes that someday everyone will have the support and information that they deserve before they need it. Please note this podcast is not a replacement for treatment by a professional or professional training. Welcome back. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. We're getting into some really good stuff today about attachment and bonding in new parenthood. And we're talking with Dr. Julie Frage again. This is her second episode with us. And she's sharing with us what attachment and bonding means and what it means for you and your baby. We'll be touching on the difference between attachment and bonding, what can happen in new parenthood when a mother or father is struggling, and we touch on that ever-present shame and guilt that comes with those struggles. Also, she gives us some good information on not needing to be perfect in order to have a good connection with your child and lots of other good stuff. Dr. Fraga is a psychologist in San Francisco, where she specializes in maternal mental health concerns. She co-facilitates a postpartum support group, The Afterglow, at UCSF. She is a freelance health writer, and she's written about women's health concerns for Refinery29, NPR, Quartz, Psychology Today, The Huffington Post, and The Washington Post. Let's meet Dr. Fraga. Welcome, Dr. Fraga. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk with you today about attachment and bonding and what that means in relation to maternal mental health and what it even is. Before we get started, though, I'd love to catch up and hear what you're doing these days for work. Recently, I am continuing to see patients in my private practice where I primarily work with pregnant women and also new mothers who are struggling with maternal mental health concerns or just adjusting to the new changes that motherhood can bring. I also co-facilitate a postpartum depression support group, The Afterglow, for UCSF Hospital, and I recently began a workshop also for expectant mothers and their partners discussing emotional self-care and the importance of that during pregnancy. I'm very excited to hear that. Hopefully, more people starting to be offering those types of courses. It just seems like that's so important in terms of prevention and getting information to people before they need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so you know so much about attachment and bonding in relation to maternal mental health in terms of what you see with your clients. Can you tell us what this all is and what it means? Sure, absolutely. You know, certainly I guess I'd like to start by kind of just defining the difference because I think sometimes the words get used interchangeably and yet they don't mean the same thing and they don't, attachment and bonding doesn't apply to mom and baby, when attachment is the connection that the child forms with caregiver and bonding is the connection that caregiver forms with the baby. So great. That's a great clarification. And it's so important. Like you said, the term is kind of loosely used now and it's really important to understand what it actually means. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about what attachment is and what it means for maternal mental health? Sure, absolutely. So let me kind of first explain a little bit more about what attachment is. So I also want to discern there's attachment. That's the connection baby forms with caregiver. Then through that connection, different styles of attachment develop. And a lot of researchers have looked at attachment and attachment styles and done studies looking at how children react when their caregivers leave the room. Mm -hmm. And so that's a study called the strange situation. But what they found is that there's caregiver and baby in a room. And when mom leaves, the baby becomes distressed. Somebody else comes in the room and they might be distressed, but then comforted by new caregiver. And then when mom returns, when the baby, you know, is happy to see mom, that is a sign what we call secure attachment. Let's say same situation, mom leaves, baby is distressed, um, new caregiver returns, new caregiver enters the room, baby's still distressed, and mom re-enters the room, baby calms down but remains distressed for a little longer. That is a sign then of what we call anxious attachment style. And then there's an attachment style where mom and baby are in the room, mom leaves, baby seems 
indifferent. New caregiver comes in. When mom comes back, baby seems also indifferent or may even kind of freeze or doesn't show bits of connection towards the caregiver. That's an attachment style known as disorganized attachment. And I should preface that children oftentimes who develop a disorganized attachment come from traumatic situations where there's been a lot of maybe abuse or neglect early on in their early development. Mm. And does this attachment style, is it across caregivers? Like not just mom, but will kids develop different attachment styles with different people? Or is this depending on who their primary caregiver is, impact how they connect with everybody? That's such a great question. You know, I have to say that I think when we talk about attachment, a lot of times the literature, I mean, and as happens with anything around children, you know, the brunt of responsibility falls on mom's shoulders. I imagine attachment style relates to primary caregiver, but certainly to partners as well, you know. Right. Okay. So these are three distinct attachment styles that children develop in relation to their caregiver. But can you say more about the bonding that happens for the mothers? Sure. So baby bonding is the connection that mom feels towards the baby. And I want to say that is something that happens over time. So I don't want to be an alarmist. Certainly if your mother has a new baby and she doesn't feel immediately bonded or have an oxytocin love rush, that does not mean at all that baby is going to have a developed less than secure attachment style. Not at all. Right. Um, You know, I think when we talk about maternal mental health concerns, oftentimes we hear that illnesses left untreated can affect the mother-baby bond, but not a lot more is said about that. And Mm -hmm. how does that happen? Well, what we know during the first three years of life, a lot of neural pathways are being laid down in the brain. The brain's developing, you know, rapidly. So there are interactions between mom and baby that are called serve and return reactions. That means Baby makes a bid for mom's attention, mom responds, you know, things kind of go along. Baby cries, mom responds, mom picks up Sue's baby. So those are all reactions. We could think of them as a cry for help. I need something from you, mom responds. So those pathways are all being kind of mapped out. And that over time is what kind of forms this attachment style, if that makes sense. Right. So, you know, in terms of a lot of moms who feel anxious and worried and they hear their child's cries and feel like they need to address it immediately or all the time or can't get to their child and feel bad when they don't. How often do, like you were explaining, there's this kind of call and response kind of a situation between mom and baby. How often do babies actually need that met in order to have the secure attachment? I mean, I believe that research shows that it's 25 to 30% of the time. So I'd like to also kind of preface that number because one thing I don't think we need is more pressure on mom's shoulders. Right. You know? And certainly there's the notion, which I think some people can kind of bristle away from, but the notion of the good enough mother, there's no such thing as a perfect mother. Right. But good enough, do you respond to your baby well enough, 25 to 30% of the time? Mm-hmm. That's good mothering. I think we live in such a perfectionistic culture now that parents may hear that term and kind of bristle at it as if people are telling them to be to a bad job at parenting. So, right. I think that's important because it makes me wonder about the interplay between that anxious, the worry that I need to attend to everything and how mom is bonding with the baby through that anxiety. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that is more of a cultural change that I mm. see. You know, Mm. I think until the 1950s, the word parenting was not even in the dictionary. What? So it entered the (laughs) dictionary in the 50s. That was amazing. more popular in the 70s. And what do we see today? What raising children is no longer about a relationship. It's a verb. It is what you do. And the minute something becomes something you do, it implies there is a right way to do it. There is Mm -hmm. a wrong way to do it. And if you're not doing, you're not mothering. Oh my gosh. That's placed an enormous burden on caregivers' shoulders. And honestly, in my practice and in my group, I see such an uptick of postpartum anxiety. Mm -hmm. I think it's because one, motherhood has become so glamorized. And two, so much is expected. And what it means to mother well has become so distorted in our culture. Wow. I mean, just that bit of history that you described is so enlightening. You know, I hear so often, well, it wasn't as hard or, you know, in my day, that kind of stuff, people talking about how things used to be. And 
just the concept of parenting that you described. So there's all of this that just came about in the 50s. I think there's a psychologist at UC Berkeley that has written a lot about baby development, Dr. Alison Gopnik. She wrote a book called The Philosophical Baby, and she's recently written a new book about this whole phenomenon. I'm blanking on the name of her book, but she wrote an article about her newest book for the Wall Street Journal and cites those statistics. So I'm going to give that credit to her, but that's where I found out about this kind of more, you know, historical lens of where the word parenting came from. Man, I might need to have her on too. That'd be a fascinating discussion. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, we're all then, all of us in our mothering years now, we're all queued up to feel like we're supposed to be bonded and connecting and in these really more intensive ways than in terms of pressure than has Mm -hmm. ever been before. And so you're seeing more anxiety. Are you seeing more difficulty with feeling connected because of that anxiety, feeling bonded because of that? Or maybe even the opposite, feeling kind of needing to make sure the connection is there so much? You know, I think one, I also want to preface that experiencing postpartum depression or experiencing anxiety does not mean your child is going to develop less than healthy attachment style at all. Right. Right. I don't want to alarm parents who have experienced anxiety or maybe anxious. And, you know, what anxiety I think does is that it takes us away from ourselves. Something doesn't feel safe. And so we get caught up in our minds Mm -hmm. trying to figure out a way to feel in control, trying to figure out a way to feel safe. Sometimes just that phenomenon can take us away from being in the present moment Mm -hmm. or overly focusing on the present moment, like looking at, you know, something so closely that we don't kind of take a step back Mm -hmm. to look at the wider lens. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, so we're coming into motherhood with our own histories and our own, you know, early forming of attachment with our parents. So in a lot of ways, there's our own kind of stuff that gets involved from our own histories in relation to how we're connecting to our children. Can you speak to that? Absolutely, because I think, you know, oftentimes when we talk of attachment, we talk about the baby forming an attachment style, mom bonding or caregiver bonding to the baby. But what rarely is looked at is how our own attachment styles play out in our feelings surrounding motherhood and in how we mother. Yeah. think, you know, again, there's not a lot of research on this topic, but just kind of based on my own clinical observations and some of the theories I know from more psychoanalytic literature. And when I say psychoanalytic, I don't mean Freud necessarily, Uh but certainly analysts that came after Freud who studied a lot about moms and babies, Melanie Klein, Winnicott, that talks about, you know, the unconscious, which is things that have happened to us and affected us in some way, but we're not solely aware of, but they still play out. And so certainly some attachment styles come to be because of trauma Mm -hmm. and trauma gets passed down through generations, um, whether or not there's an awareness there or there isn't. So I think, you know, oftentimes I don't think that causes postpartum depression, but I absolutely believe it can be a correlate and it can raise risk. And that isn't talked about Mm -hmm. that the trauma history can raise risk for a maternal mental health concern, which I think could be a real public service announcement because women who have experienced trauma, you know, familial trauma, sexual trauma, relationship trauma, if they knew that, it might destigmatize shame so that they could talk with someone about it Mm -hmm. before they become mothers so they might know a little bit of what they might expect. Mm -hmm. For example, Someone who has an insecure attachment style, an insecure avoidant attachment style, may feel like the baby's needs and the baby's cries are too much. Yeah. You know, it might just feel like too much, so they don't even realize it, but they just need to get some distance from that. That Mm -hmm. dependency just feels too close. Right. Oftentimes, anxious avoidant attachment style is where there wasn't enough nurturing. Mm -hmm. So we could see how that might play out. Oh, yeah, I'm just thinking on some level for the moms who are listening to this and hearing this information for the first time that maybe there's some like connections being made and hopefully a deeper understanding of themselves happening. And also hopefully from what you've said too, that this isn't necessarily causal, that that what they're experiencing won't necessarily cause their child to have a disorganized attachment style or something like that, that 
that these are things that can be worked with. And Absolutely. And I guess I think more importantly, I think of it, like I said, a PSA. Because mm-hmm. I think so much of the information when one prepares for parenthood mm-hmm. is around external things, mm-hmm. buying baby right. things, yeah. uh, preparing the nursery, reading baby books on what to expect from your baby. Mm-hmm. And yet I think the piece that doesn't receive as much attention, but it's very important is one of the ways to prepare for parenthood is through self-reflection, mm-hmm. through looking at your own childhood, asking yourself, what's something I wanted from my parents that I never received? How might that affect how I feel about my child? How might that affect um, my parenting? Let me tell you, you know, it plays itself out and I could, you know, I'm comfortable giving a disclosure, but I grew up with a mom who was pretty controlling and also fairly withholding. Mm -hmm. So I'll give an example of how that plays out. It's very hard for me not to overindulge my daughter. Mm. Not in the sense of, you know, with things necessarily Mm -hmm. per se, but with attunement. Right. Yeah. You know, and we can see the connections. So I want to just give that example because I feel like that's a good example that a lot of us can probably relate to, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. That does give it light. So, geez, you know, our histories are impacting how we're connecting to our children. And you're so right that that's hardly ever discussed or looked at. I mean, it's once you've become an adult, you know, you've kind of left your childhood behind as if those were two separate people, right. not different times in your life that kind of coalesce into creating your being. Right. I really think that that disconnect on some level, you know, once we have our own kids and we're having all these feelings of guilt and shame for not feeling connected or for having these uncomfortable feelings related to our child, we can't really connect them to that past very easily. We're just left sitting there with all this guilt and shame. Absolutely. And so really, like, I mean, that seems like another topic altogether. Yeah. (laughs) How shame stops us from connecting with our authenticity. Uh, How shame causes us to hide. So we think if we're hiding, then, you know, it's not happening. Right. Which isn't necessarily the case. Just in the same way that we think if we don't think about thoughts that bring about distressing feelings, the distressing feelings won't get expressed. No, they'll still find a way out. And so, you know, I think it's a myriad of all of these threads. So, you know, in the work that you're doing in your kind of couples prep for parenthood type work, that makes me think that that would be a really good place to bring these kinds of issues to the forefront. But what are ways that we can be supporting new parents through their bonding and helping to foster healthy attachments with their children? One, I think kind of smashing this myth that there's motherhood perfection, that you have to be perfect. Yeah. That good enough is the golden standard here. One, we all have histories. We've all had things that have happened to us. That doesn't make us good. That doesn't make us bad. That's who we are. And the more we can connect with that in a place of kind of curiosity and thinking about it in preparation for parenthood, that can bring about some insight. And sometimes when we realize something that's been maybe bothering us that we couldn't quite name before, it does bring relief, Mm -hmm. you know? Oh, wow. That's why I'm doing that. That makes so much sense. Wow. Okay. Right. And certainly in the workshop that I facilitate for, you know, expectant parents, I do spend a good amount of time talking about the way parenting culture has changed. Yeah. Also about the conflicts, emotional conflicts that I see play out because of this change. And that main thing, dependency conflicts. You know, caregivers, parents tend to start families later, which gives all the more time to be in your freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, but even before becoming a parent, just kind of be curious. What is it like for someone to need you? to need you all the time. Mm. And what is it like for you to have to say what you need and to rely on others for help? Mm. You know, if we think of that like as a triangle, you know, I think that can garner a lot of insight and information because those are the emotional themes that can be correlated with attachment style that can play out in new parenting. Wow. Not only then play out with the new baby, but within the couple. Absolutely. So play out kind of also with the couple. So that's something else, you know, that in the workshop, you know, I do talk about is how do you 
express your needs? Does it bring you anxiety? Are you the person that never wants to have to say what you need because it uh-huh. feels like you're a burden? Well, you know, we all can have our feelings. While that people might be able to sidestep that a little bit, pre-parenthood, when stress is high, it's going to make that all the more difficult. So mm-hmm. what are some ways you can talk with your partner now about how you're going to meet your needs? Right. And it makes me wonder too, if there's like, on some level, one partner has one kind of attachment style and the other partner has a, another one, what they're witnessing in terms of how each other is, is bonding with their child. Does um, that make sense? And how the child observes mm-hmm. over time. Right. So it's challenging because we can't be like meta thinking about this stuff all of the time. Most of the time life is happening and we're in it and we're doing it which seems to be a really good plug for why it's important to do some of this work ahead of time if you can, kind of reflection ahead of time. But certainly, you know, you don't really know how it's going to play out until the kid gets there. Absolutely. Uh, You don't know it. Kind of, I know Wendy Davis from Postpartum Support International said something so spot on one time. She said, you don't know it till you're in it. mm -hmm. That is so true. And certainly we don't want to raise anxiety, you know, Mm -hmm. for that they have to be kind of on alarm. They're going to be, you know, harming their child if they're not tuned into all of these things. I think more than anything, it's just a way to gain some understanding of self. Mm-hmm. You know? And if you know where something comes from yourself, again, it can be relieving, you know, right. to know the origin of something and to kind of catch it. Then you can use some tools and how to cope with it. And things might not feel actually as overwhelming. Right. Yeah. And this is a process in terms of bonding with anybody and having a child attached with you. It's not like you have to do all this homework and be prepared and it's all set and ready to go before they come. And then when they get here, you need to figure it out within three months. But this will just take time. And it'll change over time, you know, as your child gets yeah. into different phases, things will change, you know, things Certainly when your child reaches the tween years and they start rejecting you a little bit more. Yeah. How might that play out? Yeah. You know, there is an interesting, I've seen pretty often, and I don't know quite how to characterize this particular feeling in some moms, but for people who need reassurance, a lot of reassurance, which I would say are more on the anxious side of mothering, the very, very early months when there is really no response from the child. It's just caregiving all the time. And there's no reflection. There's no reassurance. Like I hear things like, well, I don't know if I'm doing a good job. All I hear is that I'm crying. I don't know if they like me because, you know, I don't get anything back from them. And that I think, you know, in terms of talking about a process of connection, that might be a good example of that. Right. And I think even that term, I don't know if the baby likes me, I'm not doing a good job. Mm-hmm. you know, certainly might have, a, there's a history but behind that, that worry, you know, for yeah. each woman. And certainly if there was any feelings of rejection from caregivers, like they were parentified, they had to take care of their right. caregivers, or that can certainly play out. And that would be an example of that playing out in an unconscious way. Mm-hmm. You know, the person probably isn't aware Right. right. And then they're just left with those feelings of guilt or shame yeah, and awful, you know? confusion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing and I must not be doing a good job because I've heard this too. The baby's crying, so I must not be doing a good job. Oh, yeah. You know, versus that's a way to release energy. That's how babies, right. you know, sh- that's the voice that they have. Mm-hmm. Right. I think it can be really hard to bond through those feelings. Like, you know, if I do all the stuff, I feed them, I bathe them, I do all this stuff, but you know, they might not feel the connection yet and it might just come later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a couple of really great things on how to kind of manage and understand what's going on. What have you seen in terms of, you know, for people who have had difficulty bonding with their children, how they've healed through that or coped through that? Sometimes I think that it's just, again, a process that maybe it's harder to bond at a certain phase and Mm -hmm. then the relationship is built over time. And really, I think the process for any mother who might be a caregiver seeking therapy is to really extinguish that shame, to Mm -hmm. talk about the fact it's a process, and then to become curious about our, you know, each person's individual history and how that might play out in the stress that they're feeling. 
you know. Right. Yeah. And the impacts of, I mean, whether someone is dealing with maternal mental health issue or not, the bonding attachment dynamic is happening and it still may be challenging even if there's not a postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety, but it's certainly depression and anxiety can make it more challenging and potentially take a little bit longer. I mean, depending on all these other dynamics that we've discussed. I think potentially take a little bit longer. And then I think accompanied by that, what I see is when the bond might take longer because of postpartum depression or anxiety and the healing process, then there can be a real mourning period, you know, like yeah. it took me this long and now my baby's a few months old or now my baby's six months old and I feel like I missed the whole thing. Oh yeah. That's heartbreaking. You know? Yeah. That's like so there's hard. Really, there's just so much pressure on parents to do it perfectly, you know, Wow. Yeah, there really is. I think from what you've seen too in your practice and the people that you work with, that people do make it through. They do recover. They do have that bond. Absolutely. And I would say, and your experience might be similar, but I would say the majority of women who seek therapy during pregnancy or during the postpartum period, they do get better. You know, getting better might mean gaining awareness. I think of getting better as you're not suffering as much as you were before. Mm -hmm. You have a great understanding, not that there's any golden seal of healing. I mean, who we are and who we become is a process as well. That's kind yeah. of a lifelong dissertation, <laughs> you know, as my yes. uh, analyst would, has told me. So. Oh my goodness, that is so true. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking a lot about primary caregivers or mothers, sometimes the primary caregivers, not the mom, but this process is also happening with other caregivers as well. Absolutely. Uh, And all of this applies to anyone who is doing caregiving for the child. Yeah. Uh, So they will have their own process. I'm thinking of dads. I'm thinking of grandparents who are the primary caregiver and anyone who's involved directly in child care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So if we can kind of wrap up with some hopeful messages for people who are dealing with this kind of stuff. I mean, hopeful messages, I think, is, again, kind of extinguish that pressure. But also research does show that moms who gain support, maybe from other moms or maybe from close relationships, that that really does help with this motherhood transition. So find a trusted person. It doesn't need to necessarily to be a therapist, a close friend, a close family member, that you can really be vulnerable because it's a vulnerable time. And I think that can be a huge support. It isn't necessarily by way of access, by way of finances, difficult, you know, to do. Right, right. Absolutely. Okay, so have some folks around who you can lean on a bit and talk through this stuff. That's fantastic. Well, this is such a rich discussion, and there's so many different avenues that we could go down to deepen this. But I do think this is a really great overview, and we did get into some deep stuff around deeper understandings of what this is. I'm so grateful to you for sharing this with us. And I'm hopeful that the listeners can feel understood through this. Well, thank you so much for having me and talking with me. Oh man, I really love this stuff. It really gets in and at the dynamics and challenges that we have as parents. And it's not really talked about that much in depth. It seems like this is the kind of stuff that can really help us understand our parenting journey. And as Dr. Fraga noted, you don't have to meet all of your child's needs 100% of the time in the most perfect way in order for them to be securely attached. Hopefully this information gives a little more depth and perspective to the parents that are often worried about these things. The more you know, indeed. Dr. Fraga is an amazing writer and contributes quite a bit to sources like NPR and Quartz, so please go check her out. You can find her at drjuliefraga.com or on Twitter at Dr. Fraga. Thank you for being with us today. For this and all episodes of the Mom and Mind podcast, please go to www.momandmind.com. Until next time. Thank you for joining us today. Our hope is that you leave here feeling heard, understood, and hopeful. Please share this podcast. Together we can support moms and families so that no one has to deal with this alone. Come and connect with us on Facebook and Instagram at Mom and Mind.